Anybody recognize that song? Who was it? I was thinking you were talking about the last worship song. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you recognized that one, and I hope you sung along. The, uh, the little ditty that was just playing in the background, did, did anybody hear that? Yeah. Go ahead and play it again. Let, let's, uh, well, hopefully, did you close it out? <laughs> well, okay, if you didn't recognize it right away, um, it was the theme song to uh, Unsolved Mystery. You remember that? Yeah. Remember that show with Robert Stack? I remember when I was young, it used to come on every Wednesday night, and it would scare me to death as a kid. I just remember hearing that theme song, and I remember Robert Stack's voice. It was just very, uh, very freaky. Both me and my wife agree about that. Um, but you know, I, the reason why that show and many shows like it became so popular is because we think, you know, when, when we come across a mystery, we think if we can solve that mystery, then we're going to be special. You know, we celebrate characters like Sherlock Holmes, which seems to have a sort of supernatural ability to piece together the different clues and to solve the mystery. We like to pretend like we're Sherlock Holmes. I know whenever I read those books and I watch uh, the movies that, you know, I, I leave thinking I have this special vision like Sherlock, you know, and I can, I can just see the different clues and piece them together. Uh, you know, we celebrate murder mysteries, we, we enjoy the, the whodunit mysteries, we crave to find out, you know, how it all plays out. Well, the Bible is full of mysteries, and some that have been revealed, for example, throughout the Old, uh, the Old Testament, many of the believers were wondering, who is the Messiah? Uh, you know, the Bible talked about this coming Messiah who would deliver his people unto salvation, and everyone was looking and wondering, who is this Messiah going to be? And of course, Christ came onto the scene, and, and he fulfilled the office of Messiah, of the Christ, of the, the one who was promised. And not everybody caught it, but, but some did. God revealed that to some, and, and those went out and shared the gospel to the ends of the earth, and here we are as believers today. Uh, we have solved that unsolved mystery of who the Messiah is, and we worship Christ because we believe that we've solved the mystery. It's Christ. And so we worship Him. But there were many who didn't believe that, who thought, well, no, the, the mystery is, is not solved yet. We're still waiting on the Messiah to come and deliver us. We also think about some mysteries that have not been solved yet. For example, when will Christ return? You know, when he, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples that I will be back soon. And of course, you know, coming back soon, that's about the same length of time as a husband who leaves to go to the grocery store. I'll be back soon. <laughs> then he makes a couple stops at the hardware store and, you know, goes through the drive through of McDonald's to get a quick burger before dinner. You know, things like that. And so we're still waiting. 2,000 years later, we're waiting for Christ to return, for him to, to call his church up into the air and, and for the end to come. God gave Paul insight into the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the Gentiles. Uh, when we read in Colossians 1, 25 through 29, he says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggle, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So Paul relied on Christ, on the Lord, to reveal to him the mystery of ages past, to explain to the Gentiles. And as we're reading here in Romans chapter 9, if you have your Bibles, we're in Romans chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 22. And here in Romans 9, Paul took his revelation of soteriology, which soteriology again simply means the study of salvation, or the study of how God saves. 
So Paul takes his revelation of soteriology as far as the Holy Spirit would let him. He presented the golden chain of redemption, if you remember, that God foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified all who would love him. And we looked at that text very carefully, um, and we also looked at the Old Testament scriptures, how Paul used them to demonstrate how God's sovereign choice to save some and to harden others. And it's a very complex text to, to not only understand, but also to receive and accept. And many people throughout church history have really wrestled with particularly this verse. It's one of the most, what you would call, controversial texts in all of the scripture. And the reason is because this text still leaves us with a mystery and lots and lots of questions about how God saves and how he condemns and what freedom we have in it, if any at all. We know Paul hits the edge of this mystery because he ultimately says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? And so he hits the edge of the revelation and, and essentially says to us, God is God and you are not. And God will do as he wills with his creation. And it's not dependent on anything that you do, but it's dependent upon him who wills. But Paul also is going to present us here this morning with a hypothetical or conditional reason behind why God does things the way that he does and behind his ultimate freedom to choose. So we wrestle with this idea of free will, of predestination, of election, of calling, and we wonder just where do we fit in God's design for salvation. And so here is Paul's presentation for us. Uh, starting in verse 22. But first, let's say a word of prayer, and we'll dig into his word together. Father, we rejoice in your love. We rejoice in your mercy, your kindness. But we also rejoice in your wrath, your justice, your anger towards sin, your patience on a sinful people. God, this morning we acknowledge that you are all of these things. All those attributes are who you are. And so we worship you. But we must admit, as simple sinners, we don't completely understand it. We don't completely understand some of the reasons why you do the things you do. You've left that a mystery to us. And so, Father, I pray this morning that all of us can, through faith, worship you as our creator, that we can all declare that, that you are the molder, you are the maker, and we are simply the clay. And so God, make us how you will. We submit ourselves willfully, freely to your purposes. Help us to gain as much understanding as you're willing to let us this morning. Help us to have hearts of prayer and a desire for the lost to know you. That this supernatural work that you've done in every one of our hearts this morning, God, would, would be transferred to those who don't have it, would be transmitted to those who don't have it. God, we just, we just pray that the world can know you and that your purposes ultimately will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So beginning in verse 22, Paul continues, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? So let's look at this hypothetical for a moment. Paul begins by using what if, and this term uh, in most cases used throughout the New Testament, is used to describe a, a hypothetical or conditional statement. Um, we see in Matthew 6.30 this term is used. 
If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And this verse has to do with encouraging those of you who worry day in and day out about what you're going to wear. Maybe some of you this morning, as you're getting ready for church, you're looking through your wardrobe and your closet, and you're, you're worried about what you're going to wear. Maybe you tried on four different shirts or two different pairs of pants, and maybe you did your hair in three different ways. I know for me, when my hair gets long like this, I, I can tend to spend about 15, 20 minutes because I'm like, oh, that looks horrible, and then I'm trying different ways. But then at the end of the day, you think about this kind of hypothetical thought of, well, well what if God is going to clothe you more than you could possibly close your, clothe yourself this morning? And so this statement is meant to make you think about, you know, what if God is operating on a different level than you entirely? What if God sees people differently than you or I see people? What if God can make you into something far greater than you yourself can make yourself? We also see this in Acts 8.22, which declares, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. We also see in Romans 6.8, If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And so here we see this conditional, hypothetical thought that Paul brings forward. And again, I think this is because Paul has hit the edge of the territory where God has allowed him to understand the mystery of how he saves. Now, of course, we understand this is God's word, so this is God-breathed and meant to make you think about God's character. Ultimately, we're meant to think in humility, that God is God and we are not. That if God wills to do something, it will be done, regardless of whether you agree with it or not. And so we're meant to be in a position of humility. But God also gives us a slight glimpse into how important it is that we worship and honor and glorify him for who he is. Paul suggests that God's sovereign choice, ultimately, his choice to save or condemn, is to show and to make himself fully known. In verses 22 and 23, Paul's hypothetical statement assumes that God's sovereign choice has to do with demonstrating his authority and power over expressing himself completely to us. And philosophically, we can reason that that if, we're, if it were not for the wrestle, uh, vessels of wrath, then we would not fully know who God is. We would not know in the fullness of his authority and his power. And here are a few attributes that I want to share with you uh, about how God makes himself known through condemning or through sin and salvation. First of all, God is a wrathful God. And some people might say, well, that's the Old Testament version of God. He's changed. Well, the Bible tells us God does not change. God was, is, and will always have the attribute of being a wrathful God. Colossians 3, 5 through 6 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now, is Colossians an old covenant book? Or is that a new covenant book? It's a new covenant book. So God's wrath is still coming. God is still wrathful towards our sin. Our sin still makes him angry. And if God did not carry out his sentence of wrath upon our sins, which he hates, we would not witness or understand the fact that he is a wrathful God. So that is one attribute that he wants to demonstrate and to show us. And also along with wrath, we see that God is a patient God. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. All of us have a story. All of us are sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Some of us sin longer and deeper than others. 
But the simple fact remains that all of us, at one point, were stuck in our sin. And until Christ came and delivered us, he was exercising his patience and kindness with all of us. At the first sin, at the first sin of mankind, and at your own first personal conscious sin, God should have and could have just wiped you completely out. He could have just immediately grabbed you and thrown you into hell and been completely just in doing so. But God wanted to demonstrate that he is patient. He is exceedingly patient. He is thousands and thousands of years patient upon us. Has he been patient in your life? Amen. He's been patient with me. And even as a born-again believer, God continues to be patient with me. You know, I, I think about the patience of, of my wife to put up with, with me. Uh, but even, she has a, a limit. And she hits that limit of patience and she lets me have it. Her wrath comes out. And in that moment I say, oh honey, I, I love you. Thank you for expressing to me your full character and I love to see this wrath that you give me. And, and thank you for showing me patience, for not showing me that wrath right away. It's kind of hard for us to view one another in that way, isn't it? But, you know, something clicked inside my brain, and I thought, you know, I am the only person on earth who has seen the full extent of my wife's wrath. And I count it a privilege. Today, because she's not mad at me today, so right now, <laughs> I count it as a privilege. Because none of you have seen that side of her. I haven't. And I love her for it. I love her when she gets that angry and her eyebrows do this weird thing. And, <laughs> and her nose and her lips are just twitching and this vein pops out of her head. Oh, you stop by your head, <laughs> I'm just being completely off. I mean, does, does anybody relate to what I'm talking about? <laughs> and all the smart men say no. <laughs> She's an angel from the Lord. No, but that's just one side of her. And when we think of God, that, that's one side of God. And it's who he is. And we're called to love God for the fullness of who he is. Just as our spouse, you know, even these uncomfortable moments, we're called to love them with, with all their little idiosyncrasies, all their peccadilloes, all, their, uh, all the things that make them uniquely them. When you marry someone, you take that on and you love them even in those moments. But God, in his wrath and in his patience, is perfect and good and just. There's moments where me or my wife are not perfectly good in our wrath towards each other. We just had a bad day. But God, he's perfectly calculated in love in his execution of wrath and patience for us. You know, I think about God's patience as well um, upon Pharaoh. We talked about Pharaoh last week. You know, God was patient with Pharaoh before he hardened his heart. There were seven instances where the Bible says that his heart was hardened or he hardened his own heart before God actively hardened his heart. And so I think in, in the space of free will, I, I think God gives us those that patience. Even knowing if we're, we're not going to repent, even knowing if we're not going to, to submit to him, he is still patient. And he still demonstrates his patience with all of us. Another attribute of God is that he is just. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, which says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's no need to make judgments without injustice. And the injustice that we have created, or that God has allowed, makes it uh, an opportunity for God to demonstrate that he is a just God. He is a judge, that we will all stand before him, and he will make his righteous, just decision. Either you will be divided amongst the goats or you will be divided amongst the sheep. 
And God is the only one who can make that call. And without sin, without the fall of man, we would not bear witness to God as the judge, as the just God. We would not see that he punishes evildoers, that those who carry out wicked schemes, we would not see that he is a good God who carries through with his punishment. But on the flip side of that as well, not just through punishment, but we also see that God is our Savior. And those of you here this morning who have experienced the saving grace of God, that he has, he has looked at you and he has positionally said that you are justified before me. I am making you justified and righteous before me, even as you sit, even as you continue in your sin. I am making you righteous. If you die today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus as the Savior, so that all of us, just like Luke, can say, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. God had not allowed mankind to fall. We had not experienced the sin and death entering in and us reaching the lowest point of separation with God that none of us in our heart of hearts could truly say, my spirit rejoices in Christ my Savior. So the depth of that love that you feel for Christ would not be there without God's sovereign will to save or condemn. So when you think about God revealing his power and his character to us, in his sovereignty, that is the way he designed for life to be, so that those of us who are saved can truly experience a love relationship with him, knowing him for all that he is, as a wrathful God, as a just and patient God, and mostly as a savior from our sins. And just as Paul says that salvation does not depend on human will or exertion, but entirely on God who is merciful, so also it does not depend on where you come from or where you live, your nationality, what borders you live in, what flag you wave around. It, just because someone is Israeli doesn't mean that they're saved. Just because someone is American doesn't mean they're saved. This might sting a little bit, but just because someone is Republican doesn't mean that they're saved. Irish, whatever. Uh, doesn't matter what banner that you wave. All that matters is whether Christ has saved you, whoever you are, wherever you're from. That's all that matters. And the popular idea at the time was that, well, Israel are God's chosen people, and no matter what, all of Israel will be saved. And Paul is coming to correct that bad assumption. Verse 24, he continues and says, Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. He uses four proof texts here to explain how even in the Old Testament we see that that bad assumption is not true. Not all who are Israel will be saved. And specifically, Gentiles will also enter into that salvation relationship with God. Hosea 2.23, he, he quotes, As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who is not beloved I will call beloved. So this is the idea of the Gentiles being grafted into the system of God, but also Gentiles being welcomed into the salvation of God. See, during the time of the Old Testament, Israel were God's chosen people, and those who were the surrounding nations typically were the enemies of Israel. They did not have the law. They did not have the prophets. They didn't have a God working system systematically through them. There were some that could be grafted in, uh, some individuals that we see throughout the Old Testament, but as far as nations go, God made Israel his chosen people. But then we see why, and let's continue. He quotes Hosea 1.10, which says, and in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Isaiah 10.22-23 also says, 
And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the, of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So there he says very specifically, not all of Israel, only a remnant are going to come into a true faith relationship with Jesus Christ. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. Isaiah 1.9 says, as, And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So again, some of the objectors to Paul, he anticipated, uh, many of them who would have been Jews were under the impression that all Israel would be saved, and clearly he demonstrates that they were not. God's plan of salvation was for individuals from both Israel and from the Gentiles. I'm not sure if any of you here can trace back your heritage and your, your line to Jewish blood at all. Uh, you know, I'm not sure where some of you come from. I know I'm, I'm a Scandinavian. My grandma was 100% Norwegian, so I have a little bit of that going for me, and which is cool. It's cool to look back and, you know, hey, would you like some Lutherfisk with me? You know, I can look back at the thing, you know, oh, Vikings. You know, I, I can look at that. I can be proud of that. But ultimately, all that matters is your heritage as a child of God, as a child of God. There's nothing wrong with being proud of where you come from. But you should be more proud of where you're going and the kingdom of God you belong to. Because God calls from all different nations and tribes and tongues. You don't have a special advantage being an American. You don't have a special advantage being an Israeli. God calls whomever he wills from wherever he wants. And that's the point Paul is trying to make. Verse 30, what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. I want you to notice that Israel's rejection, rejection of Christ was foretold. God's sovereign announcement that Israel would reject Jesus was foretold in Isaiah 8, 14 through 15, where he wrote, He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many shall stumble on it, they shall fall and be broken, they shall be snared and taken. The big reason why Israel ultimately stumbled over Christ when he came is because the Jews were so obsessed with trying to live perfectly and righteously according to the law which was given to them. And some of us might say, well, well it's a good thing to pursue righteousness to the best of our ability. To, to be holy as God is holy. To be excellent in everything we do. And, and while it's true that, yeah, we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we must not idolize legalism when it comes to living righteously. We, and we must not also idolize the idea that through our righteousness, somehow we're gaining an advantage with God. You cannot earn advantage with God. You cannot earn salvation from God. Didn't we read last week about how it is God who gives mercy to whomever he wills? He gives salvation to whomever he wills. He gives favor to whomever he wills. He calls and he elects according to his goodwill and purposes. And there's nothing that we can do to gain that advantage. If God has not called me to be a pastor, there's no amount of studying or work or anything else I can do to make myself become a pastor effective for the Lord's God. And it's true for any kind of role in the body of Christ. And if you want so badly to be a musician, to come up front and to play an instrument and to be a part of the band and be a part of the worship team, but God has not called you to do it, if you try and force that through, 
well, I'm, I'm going to go to, to music school. I'm going to learn how to play. I'm going to become very wise at music. And then I'm going to take leadership classes so I can learn how to, to orchestrate and organize all of it. And, 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 then, and then I'm going to come and become a part of the worship team, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to be the worship leader. If God is not in it, you're going to fail, it's going to be bad for you, and it's going to be bad for your church. God has to be the one who is directing it all. And he is the one who is directing it all. Israel thought they could direct things. They, they thought they could earn God's favor continually through their righteousness. And in doing so, when Christ came and he, he came and he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to fulfill the law, they stumbled over it. Because they were so obsessed with living according to the law perfectly that they missed the fact that salvation is by faith through, through the grace of Jesus Christ. They missed it. They stumbled over it. And suddenly Christ became an obstacle to their desire to live perfectly righteous. But let me tell you something. That if you think the church, if you think believers and Gentiles today aren't the same way, you've got another thing coming. Many of us have gone to uh, church fellowship where we have experienced the same mentality. This deep-rooted desire and idea to become so excellent and so perfect at everything we do, according to the world standards, by the way, that when Christ comes through the Holy Spirit and he tells us to do X, Y, or Z, he becomes a stumbling stone to us. Oh, but Lord, we, we have all these, these programs and these, these projects and these processes that we have in place that we're doing, and we're, we're trying to be excellent. So if you could just not tell us to do that, Lord, that'd be okay, because we, we're on the path, or we're, we're on the right path. As a church, we are completely susceptible to that as well. Now, does that mean we should become completely lazy, not fix things that need to be broken? Absolutely not. We, we should always strive to do the best we can with what we've got, so long as it depends on us. But not so much to the point where if Christ or the Holy Spirit comes and leads our church to do X, Y, or Z, that we completely in, embrace him and he doesn't become a stumbling stone to us. Because that can happen. It happened to Israel. I've seen it happen to the modern church. And I pray it does not happen here. And so Paul ultimately, I think, is making an appeal and I think we ought to make in a priority to make prayer a top priority in the church. The greatest act of free will, if we have any at all, is that we pray. Is that we pray. You ever get into a situation where you don't really know the outcome? You can't anticipate the outcome? There's a mystery in it? It's a perfect time to pray. At any time. It will, the Bible outlines many things to us about prayer. For example, how often should you pray? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. So how often? All the time. Does that mean you walk around like, oh, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, and you go fall off the stairs? No, I mean, you, you can meditate, you can communicate with the Lord as you're walking about. You know there's nowhere in the Bible that commands us to close our eyes while you pray? But when you're simply just thinking and communicating with God. It can be just an act of worship, like, oh God, how great you are. But this morning I was driving on the way to church and just this, this large flock of, of birds just kind of came flying across the street. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird. I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, don't let me hit one, because uh, we already have a crack in our other windshield. I don't need one in this windshield. I could get less about the birds. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but then, a cool thing that has never happened, happened where they, they flew across and then suddenly they changed their direction and then they came right in front of my car where they were traveling at about the exact same speed and there was these like three or four birds just hovering right in front of my windshield as I'm driving going the exact same speed. And I could see their little feet flapping in the wind. And it was just a really cool moment and I had to just kind of stop and say, thanks for that Lord, that was cool. You know, so that can be when you pray without ceasing. 
That means when things happen, you're thinking about the Lord and you're thanking him for things or you're praying in a moment. You ever been in a, a board meeting or a difficult situation where the, the tension is really high and, and you're just like, you feel your heart rate going up and your hands are starting to get shaky? You know, in that moment, you can say a silent prayer, Lord, give me the words to say or not to say. Please calm my heart so that my voice isn't quivering when I'm trying to make an excellent point, you know? So you can be praying to God through all these different situations, and you should be doing it often and all the time. Colossians 4.2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Our, our prayers should always be wrapped in thanksgiving. How should we pray? Well, Jesus gives us the perfect outline. This doesn't mean that you repeat this word for word all the time, though it is good to know uh, by heart, but essentially, categorically, these are the types of things we should be praying for. First and foremost, our Father in heaven, hallowed, how great is your name? How often in your prayers do you just say, God, your name is great. Jesus, the name above all names. We sang about that this morning. You can pray that in song. Jesus, name above all names. As you're driving to work, wherever you're going, praying that God's name would be exalted above all else. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Essentially, God, your kingdom come. Not mine, not America's, your kingdom. God, we want your kingdom to thrive. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, forgive us for our sins. Help us to forgive others the way that you have forgiven us. These are essential themes in your prayers. Again, it doesn't mean you, you can put it in your own words. These are the themes that we ought to be praying for as we pray. And then what? You know, Matthew 21, 2, whatever you ask in prayer, you'll receive if you have faith. 1 John 5, 14 through 15, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and that's the key, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So when we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, it's praying according to the will of Jesus Christ. How do we know his will? Because God has spoken. Not only through his son, Jesus Christ, not only through prophets throughout history, but God has spoken in the written word that he has given to us throughout the centuries. And here we have his complete word that we can read, we can know the heart of God, we can know the character of God, we can see his wrath, his love, his patience, his kindness, his mercy on full display throughout history according to the word of God. So when we pray, we pray according to the will of God, according to his word. And so whatever we ask, if it's according to the heart of God, of course he's going to give it. Of course he's going to give it. Prayer is so much more about you aligning your heart with God than about God aligning his heart with you. It's so much more about you just submitting yourself to God and following his leading than it is about convincing him to see it your way or convincing him to give you those things that you think you want. It's about you becoming aligned with him. And out of all the things that we can pray for, the top of our list should be the salvation of the lost. We should be praying for the exaltation of God and for the salvation of the lost. Because can you control whether someone who isn't born again becomes born again? Through your convincing argument, can you convince somebody to believe? Through your emotional plea, can you reach into the heart of a man and change his heart so that he will see the light of the gospel and change and be saved? You cannot do those things. Only God in heaven can do those things. Your part in the whole thing is to submit yourself to him. And through prayer, ask that he will change the hearts of those who don't know him like you know him. That is your part. 
And if God gives you the words to say, words of wisdom, and he uses those words, then he's going to do that. But ultimately, it's not up to you. It's up to him. And knowing this, Paul continues in 10.1. He says, Brother, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul desired deeply for his brethren, his kinsmen, the Israelites, to not stumble over Christ anymore, but to receive him for salvation. He says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul deeply desired for Israel's salvation. Paul didn't know everyone who was going to be saved. No man knows the heart of other men. God sees into the heart of every person. We don't know. Even as I look out here today, I've seen many of your fruit. I've, I've heard your testimony of, of faith, but ultimately, I don't know your heart. That's why God tells us to look at the fruit of people, because we can't see into the inner being of each person. But God can. And since none of us can see that, what's left but faith? To have faith that God is carrying out his purposes for salvation or condemnation according to his goodwill and character. And all we have to do is submit to him, have faith in him and his leading. So Paul's prayer was for the Israelites, that they would be saved. Are you praying for the salvation of the lost, those within your sphere of control, so-called control, your family, neighbors, co-workers, the stranger that you pass and suddenly you feel the urge and the desire to speak to them. That urge and desire is not from the pizza that you had for lunch. The urge is probably from God and you should listen to it. This doesn't mean you need to become a, a street preacher on the corner of the street being obnoxious to everybody. But it does mean that you need to submit to God's will. When he calls you to speak to someone, you speak to them. Now, whatever free will you have, be obedient to them. And so my prayer for all of us this morning is that we become more just sympathetic, more thoughtful about the lost, and that we would take our time to pray that the lost can be saved. And if you are here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if your heart is still unsure about him, you haven't given yourself to him completely, I want to invite you to do that today. And we're going to pray right now for you and with you. Uh, you don't even have to, to raise your hand. I, I would encourage you, though, if you do pray to the Lord and ask him into your heart, that you would please let someone know. Let, you know come up afterwards. You can let me know. And it's... This is the biggest deal. This is the biggest deal in the world, is whether you receive him or not. And I'd ask you, receive him now. Be saved, be changed, and give him glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for telling us of the way that you have saved God, we admit there is still a mystery there in, in how and exactly how that works, God, and we, we fight, we argue over that mystery, but God, I, I just, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know. And so I'm praying to you, God. I'm, I'm asking you, the Father, the heavens and the earth, the Alpha, the Omega, Jesus, the name above all names, God, I'm asking you, would you save those who are not saved here among us this morning? That in this moment, in their heart of hearts, they would re reach out to you and say, You are God. I am not. I'm 
I'm a sinner. You are perfect. I need a Savior. And I believe with all my heart that your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, is the Savior I need to be with you for eternity. So right now, I give myself to you completely. In whatever free will choice that I have, God, I am submitting myself in faith to you. Would you receive me? Would you adopt me into your family? Would you make me your child? God, I pray for those who prayed that prayer this morning. They would know with absolute certainty that you have saved them and that they are part of our family. We love you, Jesus. We pray that as we go, we would all be encouraged to pray more and more, continuously, constantly. That as we have no idea who's saved and who's not saved, God, that you would feel the urgency to go out and share it with whoever will listen. We thank you for your gospel. I thank you for this time that we got to spend this morning. And we put our full trust and hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good Sunday.